Hello everyone, I am Parnika. Today, I am back with another video. In our previous video, we have seen what is non-cooperation movement, what happened and how it went on. In the end, we have also seen that the movement turned violent in many places, so Mahatma Gandhi decided to withdraw that movement. In our video today, we will be, we'll be seeing what happened after non-cooperation movement? Our video is Civil Disobedience Movement or Towards Civil Disobedience Movement. Let's get started. In February 1922, Mahatma Gandhi decided to withdraw the non-cooperation movement. He felt the movement was turning violent in many places and Satyagrahis needed to be properly trained before they would be ready for mass struggles. Within the Congress, some leaders were now, by, were by now tired of mass struggles and wanted to participate in elections to the provincial councils that had been set up by the Government of India Act 1919. They felt that it was important to oppose British policies within the councils, argue for reform and also demonstrate that these councils were not truly democratic. C.R. Das and Motilal Nehru formed by the Swara formed the Swaraj party within the Congress to argue for a return to council politics. But younger leaders like Jawaharlal Nehru and Subhash Chandra Bose pressed for more radical mass agitation and for full independence. In such a situation of internal debate and dissension, two factors again shaped Indian politics towards the late 1920s. The first was effect of the worldwide economic recession. Agricultural prices began to fall from 1926 and collapsed after 1930. As the demand for agricultural goods fell and exports declined, peasants found it difficult to sell their harvests and pay their revenue. By 1930, the country started losing turmoil. Against this background, the new Tory government in Britain constituted a statutory commission under Sir John Simon. Set up in response to the nationalist movement, the commission was to look into the functioning of the constitutional system in India and suggest changes. The problem was that the commission did not have a single Indian member. They were all British. When the Simon Com Commission arrived in India in 1928, it was greeted with the slogan, Go Back Simon. All parties, including the Congress and Muslim League, participated in the demonstrations. In an effort to win over them, the Viceroy Lord Irwin announced in October 1929 a wake of dominion status for India in an unspecified future and a round table conference to discuss a future constitution. This did not satisfy the Congress leaders. The radicals within the Congress, led by Jawaharlal Nehru and Subhash Chandra Bose, became more assertive. The Liberals and Moderates, who were proposing a constitutional system within the framework of British Dominion, gradually lost their influence. In December 1929, under the presidency of Jawaharlal Nehru, the Lahore Congress form formalized the demand of Purna Swaraj or full independence for India. It was declared that 26 January 1930 would be celebrated as the Independence Day, when people were to take a pledge to struggle for complete independence. But the celebrations attracted very little attention. So Mahatma Gandhi had to find a way to relate this abstract idea of freedom to more concrete issues of everyday life. Then Mahatma Gandhi found and solved a powerful symbol that could unite the nation. On 31st January 1930, he sent a letter to Viceroy Arvin stating 11 demands. Some of these were of general interest, others were specific demands of different classes from industrialists to peasants. The idea was to make the demands wide-ranging so that all classes within Indian society could identify with them and everyone could be brought together in a united campaign. The most stirring of all was the demand to abolish the salt tax. Salt was something consumed by rich and the poor alike and it was one of the most essential items of food. The tax on salt and the government monopoly over its production Mahatma Gandhi declared relevant, revealed and most oppressive face of British rule. Mahatma Gandhi's letter was in a way an ultimatum. If the demands were not fulfilled by 11th March, 
the letter stated the Congress would launch a civil disobedience campaign. Irwin was unwilling to negotiate. So Mahatma Gandhi started his famous salt march, also known as the White Flowing River because of thousands of people marching in white khadi clothes, accompanied by 78 of his trusted volunteers. The march was over 240 miles from Gandhiji's ashram in Sagarmati to the Gujarati coastal town of Gandhi. The volunteers walked for 24 days, about 10 miles a day. Thousands came, came to hear Mahatma Gandhi wherever he stopped and he told them what he meant by Swaraj and urged them to peacefully defy the British. On 6 April, he reached Dandi and ceremonially, ceremonially violated the law, manufacturing salt by boiling seawater. Sea the salt mash marked the beginning of the civil disobedience movement. People were now asked not only to refuse cooperation with the British as they had done in 1921-22 but also to break colonial laws. Thousands in different parts of the country broke the salt law, manufactured salt and demonstrated in front of government salt factories. As the movement spread, foreign cloth was boycotted and liquor shops were picketed. Peasants refused to pay revenue and chaukidari taxes. Village officials resigned, and in many places, forest people violated forest laws by going into reserve forests to collect wood and graze cattle. Worried by the developments, the colonial government began arresting the Congress leaders one by one, which led to violent clashes in many places. Under the leadership of Abdul Ghaffar Khan, a devout disciple of Mahatma Gandhi, popularly known as the Frontier Gandhi, People struggled in Northwest Frontier Province. The arrest of Abdul Ghaffar Khan in April 1930. Angry crowds demonstrated in the streets of Peshawar, facing armored cars and police firing. Many were killed. A month later, after this incident, Gandhi himself was arrested. In Sholapur, Maharashtra, industrial workers attacked police posts. Municipal buildings, law courts and railway stations and all structures that symbolized British rule. The British government responded with a policy of brutal repression. Peaceful satyagrahis were attacked, women and children were beaten and about 1 lakh people were arrested. Seeing the violence, Mahatma Gandhi once again decided to call off the movement. He entered into a pact with Irwin on 5th March 1931. By this gandhi Irwin pact, Gandhiji agreed to participate in a round table conference in London and the government agreed to release the political prisoners. The Congress has boycotted the first round table conference convened in London in November 1930 to consider the recommendations of the Simon Convention. In December 1931, Gandhiji went to London for the conference but the negotiations broke down and he returned disappointed. Back in India, he discovered that the government had begun a new cycle of repression. Ghaffar Khan and Jawaharlal Nehru were both in jail. The Congress had been declared illegal and a series of measures had been imposed to prevent meetings, demonstrations and boycotts. Mahatma Gandhi again started the civil disobedience movement. For over a year, the movement continued, but by 1934, it lost its momentum. This is the end of civil disobedience movement. In our next video, let us look at the different social groups that participated in the civil disobedience movement. Why did they join the movement? What were their ideals? What did Swaraj mean to them? Till then, stay home, stay safe. Take care and thank you.